Hi, I am Ajit Virkud, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology from Mumbai. Hello citizens of the internet. Today I am going to discuss pelvic inflammatory disease. Besides discussing the epidemiology, pathophysiology, diagnosis and treatment of the condition, I am also going to ask and answer some important questions that are asked in the viva examinations like MS and USMLE. One more thing, in this two-part e-lecture, I am going to discuss only non-tuberculous pelvic inflammatory disease. PID caused by tuberculous bacilli is another major topic that requires separate video. Like respiratory tract infections, genital tract infections are also of two types. Lower genital tract infections include infection of cervix, Bartholin's glands and Skene's glands. This is known as the lower triangle of genital tract infection. Subclinical PID is common among women with lower genital tract infections. Upper genital tract infections include infections of endometrium, fallopian tubes and ovaries. This is known as the upper triangle of genital tract infection. Absence of infection of the lower genital tract does not exclude diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease. Pelvic inflammatory disease is defined as infection of the endometrium, fallopian tubes, ovaries, adjacent parametria and overlying pelvic peritoneum. Rapid urbanization and change in sexual habits has led to an increasing trend in the incidence of pelvic inflammatory disease. More than 15% of women in the United States have pelvic inflammatory disease by 30 years of age. However, of late, public and professional awareness of genital infections, especially the fear of HIV-AIDS, has led to a decline in the prevalence and spread of pelvic inflammatory disease in certain developed countries. Let us now consider some of the important factors that increase the risk of pelvic inflammatory disease. The highest rate of PID occurs among young sexually active women, that is those between 15 to 19 years of age. Various mechanisms of young age leading to PID are increased risk-taking behavior, they do not use protection, increased cervical permeability, larger zone of cervical ectopy, and decrease protective chlamydial antibodies. Sexual behavior is an important risk factor for pelvic inflammatory disease. It has been postulated that bacteria appear to attach to sperm and it is even possible that sperm can act as a vector to carry these bacteria into the uterine cavity and fallopian tubes. Hence untreated male sexual contacts are an important source of pelvic inflammatory disease. The following factors related to sexual activity increase the risk of pelvic inflammatory disease. Multiple sexual partners 4.6 times more likely to develop PID. High frequency of sexual intercourse young age at first intercourse and sex during or just after menstruation. One of the most important risk factors for PID is previous PID or current PID. Women with pelvic inflammatory disease are two to three times more likely to develop another episode of pelvic inflammatory disease later. Use of an intrauterine device has been linked to a 2 to 9 fold increase in the risk of PID. The main reason for this is its multifilament tail, which acts as a ladder along which bacteria from vagina can climb into the uterine cavity. It is one of the reasons why intrauterine devices like Dalcon Shield, Lippies Loop, Copper 7, and Safety Coil have been discontinued. The IUDs currently available in the market have a monofilament tail 
which may pose a substantially lower risk. The most significant risk is in the first 20 days, but the risk subsequently decreases to a baseline. Common gynecological surgical procedures such as endometrial biopsy, dilatation and curettage, and hysteroscopy break the cervical barrier, predisposing these women to ascending infections. Other predisposing factors are anemia, malnutrition, diabetes mellitus, low socioeconomic status, menstruation just after menses, destruction of tissue and impairment of local vascular supply, cigarette smoking, twofold increase in the risk of PID, substance abuse, and vaginal douching. Douching once a week or more has 3.9 fold higher risk of PID. Now, time for my first question. Why does an attack of acute pelvic inflammatory disease commonly occur just after menses are over? Answer Cervical mucus provides a functional barrier against upward spread of microorganisms. Opening of the cervix during menstruation along with retrograde menstrual flow may also facilitate ascent of microorganisms. Second question. How does sexual intercourse predispose to development of pelvic inflammatory disease? Answer. Intercourse may contribute to the ascent of infection through rhythmic uterine contractions occurring during orgasm. Bacteria may also be carried along with the sperm into the uterus and fallopian tubes. Now I will talk about the protective factors which prevent development of pelvic inflammatory disease. These are cervical mucus which acts as a mechanical barrier, barrier contraceptives both male and female, oral pills decrease the risk by 40 to 60 percent. Protection is due to increase in viscosity of cervical mucus. Pregnancy Amniotic membranes effectively seal off the uterine cavity and tubes from ascending infection. Bilateral tubal ligation has not been found to provide protection against PID. However, patients with bilateral tubal ligation may have delayed or minor forms of PID. Higher levels of protective antibody levels especially against chlamydia antigens, have low risk of developing pelvic inflammatory disease. Lack of menses Amenorrheic postmenopausal women are less likely to develop pelvic inflammatory disease. Now I'll discuss the pathology of PID. Pelvic inflammatory disease is a polymicrobial infection in as many as 30 to 40 percent of cases. The microbiology of PID reflects the predominant sexually transmitted pathogens. The organisms most commonly isolated in cases of acute PID are Neisseria gonorrhoeae and Chlamydia trachomatis. However, in India, the most important primary invading organism that causes PID is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Other causative organisms are Gardnerella vaginalis, Mycoplasma hominis, Mycoplasma genitalium, Urea plasma urealyticum, herpes simplex virus type 2, Trichomonas vaginalis, Cytomegalovirus, Haemophilus influenzae, Streptococcus, E. coli, Enterococcus, Peptococcus species, and various anaerobes. Neisseria gonorrhoeae. Chlamydia trachomatis, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and sometimes anaerobes are the primary invading organisms. This is followed by infection with secondary organisms such as facultative anaerobes and other gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Chlamydia trachomatis is more likely than gonococcal infection to cause permanent tubal damage. This is because 
chlamydia serpingitis causes minimal to no symptoms therefore it is likely to lead to prolonged untreated infection causing permanent tubal endothelial damage microbial virulence appears to play a significant role in pid women with hiv infection also have an increased risk of progression to pid and tubo ovarian abscess the organisms involved depend on the type of infection ascending infection is caused by neisseria gonorrhoeae and chlamydia trachomatis whereas purpural infection is mainly polymicrobial involving staphylococci streptococci e coli and clostridium perfringens This diagram illustrates the mode of spread of infection. In 90% of cases it occurs by direct ascending infection. It can also occur by lymphatic or venous spread by blood stream for example in genital tuberculosis and by continuity or contiguity from adjacent viscera. For example transperitoneal spread from a perforated appendix or intraabdominal abscess it has been found that endometritis usually occurs via lymphatics genital tuberculosis by hematogenous spread and acute salpingo ophoritis by ascending infection bacterial properties increasing the probability of frank pid are production of chlamydial heat shock protein 60 by chlamydia and p90 pab by gonorrhea organisms pelvic inflammatory disease is of two types acute pid involves acute endometritis which is transient and this is commonly seen in puerperium acute salpingitis which is a pyosalpings or salpingo ovaritis and pelvic abscess which may be unruptured or ruptured chronic pid is a sequelae of acute pid pathology associated with chronic pid is chronic salpingo ovaritis hydrosalpings tubo ovarian masses and rarely frozen pelvis now i will talk about pathogenesis of hydrosalpings which is commonly asked as a specimen in exams hydrosalpings is a retort shaped mass with thin translucent walls the external surface is smooth but may show few adherent tags or adhesions it appears to contain watery fluid fimbriae are not visualized on cut section if unilocular it suggests hydrosalping simplex and if divided into multiple compartments by trabeculae it suggests hydrosalpings follicularis question why is hydrosalpings retort shaped answer when the inflamed tube distends with exudation of pus the mesenteric border restricts its stretching and enlargement whereas the anti mesenteric border of the thin ampullary portion of the tube expands the thick ischemic portion is more resistant to enlargement thus giving rise to a retort shaped mass what causes hydrosalpings acute pid causes obstruction of corneal and fimbrial openings of the tube along with indrawing of fimbria inflammatory exudate of pus which is formed initially gets absorbed leaving behind a clear fluid that is hydrosalpings grading of hydrosalpings is based on its maximum diameter it is said to be mild when it is 0 to 2 cm in diameter moderate when 2 to 5 cm in diameter and severe if the maximum diameter is greater than 5 cm in severe hydrosalpings endosalpingeal mucosa especially the cilia are irreparably damaged and tuberosity is useless before this grading came into vogue 
In our residency days, we used to talk about Shirodkar's rule of thumb. According to VN Shirodkar from Mumbai, India, if the hydrosalpinx is bigger than a human thumb, there is irreparable destruction of endosalpingeal cilia and salpicostomy or salpingoneostopy to open the tubes will be merely a surgical exercise with no functional success. Pelvic inflammatory disease has three main long-term complications which I am going to discuss at length. These are infertility, ectopic pregnancy and chronic pelvic pain. About 20% of women with PID become infertile. The risk of infertility increases with each episode of pelvic inflammatory disease. It is 12% with one episode, 20% with two episodes and 40% with three or more episodes. It should be noted that pelvic inflammatory disease is a preventable cause of infertility. Various mechanisms of fallopian changes leading to infertility in PID are tubal plicae, chronic follicular salpingitis, denuded epithelium, scarring, fusion of fimbriae leading to hydrosalpinx, accumulation of secretions leading to dilatation of tube, thick pus absorbed leaving clear fluid behind that is hydrosalpinx and adhesions. Spontaneous resolution of symptoms may occur in some women but early initiation of treatment is needed to prevent impairment of fertility. Clinical improvement may not necessarily translate into improved fertility. Observational studies suggest that delaying treatment by three days can impair fertility. The risk of ectopic pregnancy is increased 15 to 50 percent in women with history of PID. Ectopic pregnancy is a direct result of damage to the fallopian tubes. Chronic pelvic pain occurs in approximately 25 to 40 percent of patients with history of PID. The pain is thought to be related to cyclical menstrual changes, but it may also be the result of adhesions or hydrosalpinx or teomas. PID may produce tubo ovarian abscess in 15 to 34 percent of cases. Now I will talk about disseminated PID. Infection and inflammation from severe PID may spread to the abdomen producing pelvic and later generalized peritonitis including perihepatic adhesions which is known as Fitz-Hugh-Curtis syndrome. Rarely it may further lead to bacteremia, endocarditis, meningitis and suppurative arthritis. This is known as disseminated PID which commonly occurs following gonococcal infection. Death from acute pelvic inflammatory disease is very rare in modern gynecology, but in the past it was not that rare. Differential diagnosis of PID includes the following conditions. Appendicitis, ectopic pregnancy, pelvic endometriosis, ovarian cysts, ovarian torsion, adnexal tumors, and interstitial cystitis. Women from resource poor countries like India experience an increased rate of complications and sequelae. Reasons are lack of access to care and inability to afford optimal care. This is the end of part 1 of my e-lecture on pelvic inflammatory disease. In part 2, I will discuss the clinical features, diagnosis and treatment of PID. For further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology, refer to following books written by me. Practical Obstetrics and Gynecology Modern Obstetrics Modern Gynecology 
clinical cases in obstetrics, questions and answers. Clinical cases in gynecology, questions and answers. And pelvic reconstructive surgery. If you have found this video useful and informative, please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here.